Hey there, everybody! Welcome back to Reacteria! I am pumped, I'm a little bit sunburned, and I am super excited to be reacting to this video, or actually videos today, because I've been teaching science for a long time. And over the years, I've had a bunch of people tell me that evolution is a farce. And I thought that that was a really, really weird word choice, especially when it was coming from somebody who was younger. When a middle schooler uses the word farce and they are not currently in a theater class, something has gone horribly wrong. So I brought it up on TikTok a little while back and asked if anybody knew where this word came from, and several people came forward talking about some weird creationist handbook that their parents or grandparents used to refer to all the time. And eventually, we came up with the name of the author of that book, a man named Hank Hanegraaff, aka The Bible Answer Man. So I typed that name and the word farce here into YouTube, and I found this video published by the man who wrote the book himself. It's Hank Hanegraaff, everybody! And not only did he publish a four-minute video explaining what he means by the word farce, but he also published a short series of two-minute videos, one for every letter of the word. So it seems like farce is an acronym to easily remember several creationist arguments all at once. So I'm gonna watch all of these, and we're gonna see what they're all about. But before I do, you know I gotta thank my patrons on Patreon. They are all extraordinary people with kind hearts and well-shaped ears, and they make this dream a reality. And the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. Nord sponsors my channel a lot, and they always give fantastic deals to my subscribers, so you really ought to go check them out. After all, what if you need to protect your privacy from online looky-loos? You're gonna need Nord. What if you're in a pinch and you need to use a public Wi-Fi network? You're gonna need Nord. What if you want to access online content that usually isn't available in your region? You're gonna need Nord. What if you're on an epic quest to the outer reaches of the internet and you get, like, ambushed by, uh, goblins who try to steal your bandwidth? I think I need to start scripting these. Anyway, you're gonna need Nord. If you want to learn more about NordVPN and how they can help you, and take advantage of their huge discount off of a two-year plan, plus an additional month free, head over to nordvpn.com slash Labs. Try them out! Worst case scenario, you don't like it and you get your money back because of Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. It's a win-win-win situation, y'all! And now, with that out of the way, let's get into these videos. Hello, everybody. This is Hank Hanegraaff president of the Christian Research Institute, host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. I want to talk to you for a moment about the farce of evolution, a flip chart that I've developed. And instead of getting into all of the details, let me simply say this. I use farce as a memorable way by which you can internalize the reasons evolution is untenable in an age of scientific enlightenment. Let me give it to you real quickly. The F represents fossil follies which is to say the fossil record simply says no. There are transitions within kinds, but not from one kind to another kind. A cat doesn't evolve into a dog or vice versa. Okay, so right off the bat, that's obviously not true. The fossil record gives us a robust account of evolution, both within and between taxa, or kinds as he would call them. And just to remind you, kind is not a biological term, it is a creationist term. But just to be really, really clear on his point here about transitional fossils. Pekeia, transitional chordate. Guiyu, transitional fish. Tiktaalik, transition between fish and tetrapods. Ichthyostega, transitional amphibian sensu lato. And then Triatobatrachus, transitional amphibian sensu stricto. Archaeopteryx, transitional bird. Thranaxodon, transitional mammal. Aomea, transitional placental mammal. Ambulocetus, transitional whale. Mesohippus, transitional horse. Purgatorius, transitional primate. Egyptopithecus, transitional ape. And the two most important things to remember about every single one of those species is, number one, they each possessed both ancestral and derived traits, which is why they're classified as transitions between taxa, and also that their classification as transitional is completely arbitrary. We make definitions to fit nature. Nature doesn't structure itself to fit our definitions. So what we do with these taxa and how we classify them is completely up to us. If you had every single skeleton showing, say, whale evolution, 
from Indohias to Pachycetus to Ambulocetus to Rhodocetus to Durodon to Basilosaurus to a sperm whale and every single skeleton in between, there would not be a single place where you could say that's a whale and nothing else is before it. That's, that's just not how it works. Every single species and every single fossil is transitional. However, this is just the summary video, so let's see if he goes into any more detail in his video specifically about the letter F. There are no transitions from one kind to another kind, and that is a trade secret among paleontologists. And as a result of that, they've come up with all kinds of novel notions to explain away the poverty of the fossil record. One of those is a punctuated equilibrium. It is the idea in essence, the idea at least that a, uh, that a lizard lays an egg and out comes a bird fully formed with wings and tail feathers. <laughs> okay, so he did go into more detail, but he didn't make anything any better. Just to be perfectly clear, punctuated equilibrium is not the idea, either in essence or otherwise, that a lizard gives birth to a fully formed bird or anything even close to that. It's just a way of explaining the trends that we see in the fossil record of periods of rapid evolutionary change followed by periods of relative stasis. And those trends actually make a lot of sense when you study things like mass extinction events, adaptive radiation, and niche partitioning. So, no. Just ev everything that he just said was a million percent wrong. Now, that must surely stretch credulity beyond the breaking point. I mean, the genetics uh, for a bird are the genetics to reproduce another bird, not another kind of animal. Fascinating observation, Hank. You're absolutely correct. Birds do only possess genes to produce more birds. But let's do a little thought experiment. What do you suppose might happen if we were to just tweak those genes just a little bit, especially the genes in the germ cells, in the sperm and eggs that actually do produce more birds? What if we were to change those genes by some totally normal, natural, everyday, well-documented, and easily observable process, like, say, mutation, for example. What if we were to mutate those genes just a tiny amount? I bet then the birds that they produce would be slightly different. The children would be a little bit different than their parents. That would make sense, and we see that all the time. But what if that happened a bunch? Like, what if each and every generation changed just a tiny bit, perhaps because of some sort of external pressure where the ones that didn't have those changes didn't reproduce as much, and the ones that did have those changes reproduced more. Then, each generation would be different until we got to a point where they were so different that you wouldn't even be able to really call them birds anymore. Like, you'd have to make some totally new classification and say, these were the birds, and now these new things really don't fit our definition of bird anymore because they've changed so much after so many generations. That would be truly interesting. I wonder what we could call a process like that. Hmm. Oh, how about evolution? By the way, I just want to put in a quick disclaimer here before we go any further so everybody knows what's going on. After watching that video and the first segment of the summary, they were remarkably similar. He said all the same talking points. He used almost the exact same language. He's even wearing the same clothes. He just went into a tiny, tiny bit more detail into what he was talking about. So I'm just going to go ahead and decide right now that when I edit this, I'm just going to chop all these videos up and put them together. And I'm not going to say which video I'm on anymore because it would be madness for me to sit here and say, oh, well, here's this video, but what does this one say? Okay, now back to the original video over and over and over. It would be insane for me to do. It would be garbage for you to watch. So if you want to go watch all of these videos and make sure that I didn't cut out anything crucial or misrepresent him in any way, you're free to do so. But if you do that, you're going to realize that he repeats himself an awful lot and that he's trying to sell his book for like 50% of every one of these videos. Which, no shade, I do an ad read in every single one of my videos. I try to sell t-shirts, talk about Patreon. I don't have a problem with that. But it means that there's only like maybe 30 to 90 seconds of actual content for me to talk about here. So just for all of our sanity's sakes, these will all be one video now. And you won't notice the difference. It'll be seamless for the rest of my video. So that, that's how this is going to be, okay? Cool. On to letter A. The A represents ape men fiction, fantasies, and frauds. The, the irony is that the icon of the knuckle-dragging ape evolving into a human being has been pictured so many times in magazines like Time and 
newspapers, and textbooks. This is nitpicky, but like the cadence of that sentence was so weird. Like he said time, and then there was this pause before he said newspapers and magazines. It sounded like he planned on giving a list of magazines, but when he put himself on the spot, he could only remember time, and then he just moved on. It has been pictured so many times in magazines like Time and newspapers and textbooks that the icon has actually become the argument. But truthfully, as you'll see in the flip chart, it's a dogmatic assertion. It's not a defensible argument. Okay, so he's not super clear here about which icon he's referring to, but by what he's saying, it sounds like he means the March of Progress by Rudolf Zollinger. And the problem with that is that that isn't our argument. That's not even a good representation of our argument. Anybody who knows anything about evolution knows that that image is at best a gross oversimplification and just wildly inaccurate. One time in college, we had a whole day dedicated to that diagram and why you should never use it and all of the harm that it's caused to the public's understanding of science. I had to write an essay about why that diagram makes no sense on a test in grad school. I've talked about that diagram and why it's nonsense on this channel, in this series, several times. So for him to say that that is our argument and that it's some dogmatic thing that we all look up to, it's nonsense. And it just goes to show that this dude has never ever talked to anybody who actually knows how evolution works. In case you haven't heard me talk about this before and you don't want to go scouring my channel to see where I did, here's a quick recap. This image leaves out a massive amount of really important details. It ignores things like gene flow between populations, especially populations of different species like Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. It takes all of the data and all the fossils that we have showing human evolution and just throws them out and leaves just a few clear-cut steps. And in so doing, it also reinforces incorrect ideas like ones that Hank has talked about here of how evolution works by one species just magically giving birth to a totally different new species. It also subtly implies orthogenesis, which is an outdated, obsolete, teleologically biased idea that evolution has some sort of goal in mind, which helps people think that evolution is like this thing that's like a ladder and that humans are more evolved than everything else, which is absolute nonsense. Just suffice it to say, this diagram does way more harm than good, and nobody who actually understands evolution thinks that it's a good thing at all. Also, for Hank to claim that this image is dogmatic would mean that scientists would be checking this image to learn how evolution works. That we would be referring to it every time we didn't understand something. That we would use it for clarification and verification of our beliefs. That's simply not how science works. And personally, I think it's really weird and kind of funny that anybody who said this... Martin Luther said this about the Bible, I have made a covenant with God that he sends me neither visions, dreams, nor even angels. I am well satisfied with the gift of the Holy Scriptures, which give me abundant instruction and all that I need to know for this life and for that which is to come. Everything necessary for faith and for practice in the Word of God. And a reminder once again as we begin this week of broadcast that it is the Word of God that is our rule, our standard, our measure. Would ever accuse anybody of making dogmatic and indefensible arguments. The truth is, science is the exact opposite of dogma. No scientific diagram is going to be a perfect representation of reality, especially not one that is simple enough and stylized enough to slap on a t-shirt or be used in marketing. But for somebody to ignore that and then to go on to say that that's all that science has to offer would require that that person is deliberately ignoring any information that challenges their worldview. You know, like somebody who's wrapped up in dogma would do. Let me give you one example. A Nebraska man. Nebraska man is actually one tooth found on a farm in Nebraska. With a little imagination, the tooth was attached to a mythological jawbone, the jawbone to a skull cap. To that was added a skeleton. And by the time the story hits the London news, you not only had Nebraska man, but Nebraska mom. All of that from one single tooth. Now imagine what 
they would have done if they uh, they had found a skeleton. They would probably have printed a yearbook, but in fairness, they did find a skeleton. Sometime later, they found another tooth, and that tooth was attached to a jawbone, the jawbone to a skull cap, the skull cap to a skeleton, but alas, it was the skeleton of an ancient wild pig. So here you had scientists trying to make a... Uh, a, a, a monkey out of a pig, and the pig makes a monkey out of the scientists. Nebraska Man is another one that we've talked about before on this series, but just in case anybody doesn't know the story, he's right. Back in 1917, a farmer found a pig tooth and sent it to his friend, who's a paleontologist, who accidentally misidentified it as an ape tooth. And the two of them published their findings as the new missing link, proof of this amazing new ape that lived here in North America. What Hank doesn't talk about is the fact that nobody believed them. They didn't gain any traction in the scientific literature. There are plenty of papers from around that time explaining why they are very obviously wrong in their conclusions. Lots of newspapers picked up this story because newspapers are in the business to sell newspapers. This was an exciting story. But newspapers aren't scientific journals. So for scientists, this was a singular event that was forgotten about just as quickly as it happened because everybody makes mistakes. But for creationists, this one single error is still being talked about over a hundred years later. But hey, if one single mistake by one random person is enough to discredit an entire field of study, it sure is a good thing that nobody from Hank's camp has ever made any predictions that turned out to be untrue, right? The R stands for recapitulation, known by the popular evolutionary cliche, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The idea that the emerging embryo in a mother's womb goes through all of the evolutionary phases. So at one point, it's a fish, then a frog, and eventually a fetus. First of all, that's not what that phrase means. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny was the catchphrase of Haeckel's biogenic law which just stated that an animal embryo would reflect its evolutionary history over the course of development. It didn't mean that it was literally a fish and then literally a frog and then a fetus, which, by the way, a fetus is just a developing embryo. It's just another word for that. Usually it's termed for like late stage stuff, but it's not like it was a fish and then a fetus. It was always a fetus. It's so weird that you phrase it that way, but it doesn't matter. The point is, Haeckel made these assertions in the 1800s, and nobody was able to recreate his results, and so his ideas were subsequently abandoned. Then, also in the 1800s, von Baer produced his laws of embryonic development, which provided a much more accurate picture of how our evolutionary history is actually reflected during embryonic development. Namely, that structures that arise early in development are more widely distributed across different kinds of organisms than structures that arise later in development. So we all start out with the same general framework early on, showing common ancestry, and we get more and more specialized as we develop, reflecting our history. And while not all of Von Baer's ideas hold up today either, the simple observation that early developmental stages are conserved across vastly different taxa is a very clear and easily testable fact. From gill slits to fur to tails, we all show our evolutionary history in utero. So again, not only is Hank completely misrepresenting science here, he's doing it with arguments from over a hundred years ago. Like, we know that you get your science lesson from a book from the early Iron Age, but the rest of us don't do that, dude. Now, we know that something else is true, and that is the embryo has full personhood from the moment of conception. That's not a theological conclusion. That's plain old experimental evidence, and we ought to be able to communicate that. Really? How do you know that? More importantly, exactly what experimental evidence are you talking about there? Because last I checked, there is no scientific consensus on when personhood begins, because personhood is an ontological question, not a scientific one. You 100% just made that up. And anybody who's taken even a freshman level anthropology class can tell that you're lying. 
and using the words experimental evidence to try to lend yourself some credibility and fleece the people watching you. Bad look on you, Hank. It's been used for all kinds of pretexts, including it becomes a substantiation for theories like Roe v. Wade. Ugh. Where to start with that? First of all, Roe v. Wade isn't a theory. It's a Supreme Court case that set legal precedent for issues of medical privacy and in so doing, protected the right to abortion. The whole foundation of the Roe v. Wade decision was that the Ninth Amendment's protection of individual rights was broad enough to cover the right to terminate a pregnancy, and that the Fourteenth Amendment's Due Process Clause also included the right to privacy, including medical privacy, which means the government can't dig up your medical records and put them on display in order to try you for abortion. So any ban on it would be unenforceable anyway. The decision also says, and I'm just going to read this part verbatim because of what Hank just said about experimental evidence for personhood. We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins, when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary is not in the position to speculate as to the answer. Roe v. Wade has zero to do with personhood. It is about individual rights, namely medical privacy and bodily autonomy. And for you and so many other creationists to continue using abortion as this bizarre moral argument against science is unbelievably weird, dude. Roe v. Wade, because if you abort, as Carl Sagan, who once was the most popular evolutionist on the planet, if you abort in the earliest stages of a pregnancy, you're not really terminating a child, you're terminating a creature. So, again, consequences. Consequences. I'm sure that everyone will be shocked to hear this, but that's not what Carl Sagan said. How do I know what Carl Sagan said? because he wrote a whole article about it and published it in Parade Magazine and then published it again in this book called Billions and Billions, Thoughts on Life and Death at the Brink of the Millennium. By the way, the people in the book club buddy tier on my Patreon will be getting a copy of this in a couple of weeks. Throughout this chapter, he never once says that it's okay to kill a fetus at a certain point because it's a creature and not a human. What he says is that the developmental milestones that we refer to when talking about abortion are all arbitrary and not unique to humans. And then in spite of that, he concludes the chapter by arguing that abortion during the third trimester should be prohibited except in cases of grave medical necessity. The whole point of this chapter was to draw attention to the fact that this is a diverse and complex and difficult issue and to give a variety of perspectives from a logical and scientific framework. You dumbing down what he said into a weird little soundbite like that is a huge part of the problem that he wrote this paper to address. Maybe if Hank were to actually read Carl Sagan and Andrew Yan's work, as well as the Roe v. Wade decision, and probably the U.S. Constitution for good measure, and any biology textbook from the 21st century, he would learn to stop referencing things that make the exact opposite argument that he's making while referencing them. But who knows? The C stands for chance. In other words, that which happens without purpose. I find it genuinely odd how much creationists crave purpose. You hear it over the course of all of these videos. This couldn't have happened on accident. There must be a purpose. I was designed with a purpose. How awful. How absolutely soul-crushingly horrible to have a purpose. To have your whole life be laid out with one intention in mind. To be born with a goal. No freedom, no choices, no mistakes, no chance to choose your own adventure or to design your own destiny. Just total objectification of your entire being. I would rather not be alive than to live on someone else's orders. Ugh. But more than just asking what it would be like to have a purpose, if you're going to assert that everything does have a purpose, you also need to be asking what that purpose is, and if it's a good purpose. 
The most common form of cancer in children is leukemias, cancers of the blood and bone marrow. What's the purpose of that? Entamoeba histolytica is an amoeba and a parasite of humans. If you ingest it, it can burrow into the mucosa of your intestinal lining and cause amoebic dysentery, which unlike regular dysentery where you could die of dehydration, causes you to poop so hard and so often that your heart gives out and you die of exhaustion. What's the glorious purpose behind that organism? The Holocaust, Holodomor, Darfur, Armenia, Rwanda, East Timor, Guatemala, were these genocides carried out by people who were fulfilling their purpose? Or were they just somehow able to ignore the best laid plans of the creator of the universe? So, I guess what I'm really asking is, is this plan evil or is it just easy to ignore? Any plan that involves a world where tens of thousands of children starve to death every single day is a bad plan. And what is the chance that an egg, a human egg, is a function of mere random processes? The statistical probability for that renders it not only implausible, but impossible. Interesting. And how exactly did you calculate that? You see, if you had just said that it's improbable, we would be having a totally different conversation. But you specifically said that it is the statistical improbability that led you to this conclusion. So if I were, for example, to roll a die, I could say that there's a one in six chance of it landing on any particular number. Because I know that there's one outcome where that could work, and there's five other outcomes where it doesn't. I can measure all of those outcomes. So how exactly did you measure all of the universes where human eggs didn't evolve? But hey, maybe you didn't do those basic cut and dry statistics that we all know. Maybe you did the experimental statistics that I had to learn in college. So tell me, how many tests did you run? What were your controls? What was your p-value? Nope, nope, silly me. Those are all objective statistics. If we're talking about a singular event, like somebody winning an election or somebody beating cancer, or arguably an egg evolving, that would be a more subjective kind of statistics. And those can still be meaningful, but they require a tremendous amount of background research. Otherwise, they're just a pure meaningless shot in the dark. So tell me, who exactly put in all the hard work for you to be able to make a claim like that? Look at this. I looked up statistical analyses of evolution on Google Scholar. I actually did some scholarly research, and right away I found this article, which is written by an actual scientist who ran an actual Bayesian analysis, both on the prospect of life beginning on Earth and of intelligence evolving. This is, again, real statistics backed by real biological evidence. And he found that if we were to turn back time and run the experiment called Earth again, statistically speaking, life is more likely to evolve quite rapidly than slowly, and, uh, oh, it looks like intelligence evolving is actually a little bit more rare, statistically speaking, coming in at only 3 to 2 beating odds. Isn't that lucky for us? In case it isn't abundantly clear, statistical probability is another empty, meaningless buzzword that this guy is using to try to pull one over on his audience. It's the exact same thing as when he said empirical evidence a minute ago with nothing to back it up with. It is pure, unadulterated, dishonest nonsense. Now, chance, in the sense I'm going to use it with respect to evolutionism, has to do with that which happens without purpose. The idea that there's design without a designer. Now, think for a moment about random, purposeless processes being the pretext for making evolutionism plausible. Let's, let's think for a moment about but, but just your eyes. I mean, as you're looking at me right now or watching the video on YouTube or on the World Wide Web at Equip.org, a vast number of impulses are traveling from your eyes through tiny little nerve fibers into a complex computing center in the brain called the visual cortex. Linking visual information from the eye to the brain is not only critical 
But without it, you could not do virtually anything from going to the bathroom to writing the word farce on a piece of paper. Wow! You heard it here first, folks. Blind people are all but helpless. They can't go to the bathroom. They can't even write. I swear this dude just says the first thing that pops into his head. For those of you who enjoy thinking, I'm putting a link to the National Federation of the Blind in the description below. They're an incredible organization. I had the privilege of attending one of their events a few years back, and I was absolutely blown away by the amount of resources and education and empowerment that they give to people both within and outside of their community. In fact, they were the ones who taught me a lot of what I know today about how to be a good advocate for marginalized groups. And one of my favorite lessons that they taught me was that there's a big difference between weather and how. If you ask whether a blind person or a person with any disability can work a certain job, can take care of themselves in a certain way, or whatever it may be, you're putting yourself in a position of separation and authority and deciding for them what they're capable of and what their life is going to be. But when you ask how they can do certain things, you're starting the conversation by acknowledging that they can, even if they might have to do it differently than you. And not only does this help our understanding of diversity, it also helps to highlight areas in which our society is lacking in accessibility or equality. I mean, the fact that it's still a struggle to get Braille into public schools should tell you enough. The whole concept of linguistic relativism is just that the way that we structure our language, the words that we choose, have a real impact on our worldview and the way that we perceive the people around us. Way too many people think and talk like Hank does, that if you can't see, you just can't do anything. Without the coordinated development of the eye and the brain in synergistic fashion, the isolated development of either is not only meaningless, it is, well, it's counterproductive. Yeah, I've talked about eye evolution a bunch before. I'm not going to cover it again in this video, but suffice it to say, it's not nearly as big of a mystery as creationists like to pretend. Also, this doesn't apply to eyes, but... The assertion that the entire organ has to all evolve at once all together in order to be functional isn't necessarily true either. Different parts of a structure can evolve at different rates both within and even sometimes between different species in order to present as one major functional thing at the end of that evolutionary process. It's called mosaic evolution and we have lots and lots of examples of that too. So this is just the same irreducible complexity mousetrap argument of I wouldn't be able to see with half an eye so evolution makes no sense. It's nonsense and nobody on our side of the table is actually putting forth anything like what this guy is talking about. This is the guy? This is the guy that I've been hearing about for all these years? Like we're almost done with this video and I don't think he's even accurately described what evolution is once. And then the E stands for empirical science. And in that section in the flip chart, I actually, in a memorable fashion, gives you, give you all of the information demonstrating that empirical science militates against the evolutionary hypothesis and undergirds the creation model for origins. I feel like we end up here all the time, but I really, really can't stress this enough. In order for science to support the creationist model, it would first have to demonstrate a creator. The reason why science backs evolution is because we have a good understanding of every single part of it. We can test it in a lab, we can test it in the field, we can see the underlying mechanisms, we can watch it happen before our very eyes, we can dig down deep into the tiny little fundamentals of it, or we can blow it up and see the big picture. We have so much evidence for evolution, we have so much understanding of it, and we are still being surprised by all of the incredible new things that we're learning every single day. So before you get to say, God did this, you first need to do all of that. You need to prove that this God exists, then you need to run tests on it to show that it can do all of the things that you say it can do, and then you need to prove that it did those things. You need to break it down to its fundamentals and see it as the big picture in an objective way that we can all test and we can all verify. When you put your God on my dissection table, we'll talk. 
But until then, even if you could completely debunk evolution in its entirety, you wouldn't have done a single thing to back up your claims in creationism. X equals zero does not mean Y equals one. And we can safely say in an age of scientific enlightenment that there's nothing more scientific or scripturally correct than in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Are we using the same definition of enlightenment? Are we using the same definition of scientific? Are you high? And one of the things I point out in this flip chart is that while we might think that there are all kinds of possibilities for the explanation that can account for the universe in which we find ourselves, in reality, there are only four. And let me go over them rather quickly. You can get more detail in the flip chart. The second idea is that the universe sprang from nothing. Now, this also is patently absurd. Uh, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. And, and by the way, that's the implausible position the evolutionist is in. They have to say that nothing creates everything, that life came from non-life, and that the life that came from non-life produced morals. That takes faith. Oh, my glob, dude. Just so many first of alls. Prove that nothing can come from nothing. Go ahead. I don't even know what nothing is. What do I have in my hand? Nothing? No. There's light. There's air. There's gravitational waves. There's neutrinos passing through. There's all sorts of things here. I don't have any samples of nothing upon which to run tests, so I have no idea what it is capable of. I've never even seen nothing, and neither have you. Nobody is saying that everything came from nothing. You are making up an argument so that you don't have to put in the hard work of actually learning the science that you're trying to debate against. And then you end it with that smug line trying to drag us down to your level saying that science requires faith. When your whole worldview is based on faith. So I'm glad we agree that it's not a reliable path to truth, but you really don't see how that's going to bite you in the butt first? Besides, that would be lumping in everything that requires our understanding of evolution to function, things like medicine and agriculture, in with things that are truly faith-based and completely lacking in evidence. Things like Bigfoot and Elvis sightings and alien abductions. Your argument is just self-destructive, patently lazy, and so incredibly boring, dude which leaves you with only one other plausible possibility. It's not only plausible, but it is the operative, correct answer to the origin of the universe, and that is, in the beginning, God. That is neither an answer, nor is it a complete sentence. Every effect has to have a cause equal to or greater than itself, and certainly that is true of the universe. I mean, if you were walking down a path and you discovered a basketball, you wouldn't think that it made itself. You would know that there was a basketball maker. How much more so with the universe? Every effect needs a cause that is equal to or greater than itself. Okay, what caused God? What is equal to or greater than God that created God so that it could go create the universe? After all, if you were walking down a path and you came across a god, you wouldn't just think that it made itself, right? You would know that there is a god maker that made this god. That's just common sense, right? And if you want to say that god doesn't need a designer, that god is the only effect without a cause, okay, then I get to say the universe doesn't need a designer. It is the only effect without a cause, and it means the same thing. And if you want to say, no, 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 God is outside of the universe. God is outside space and time, so it has special rules. Okay, you're right back where you just were a minute ago with zero scientific evidence on your side because we have no evidence of anything outside of the universe. That doesn't even really make sense. What is beyond everything? We don't even have anywhere in the universe where the laws of physics are even slightly different. So you're telling me there's a whole other place outside of every place where reality is different? Prove that first. 
then prove God, then we can get somewhere. You just keep making rules that you yourself can't follow. It's like I'm watching someone hunting for bears by sticking their own leg in a bear trap over and over. What are we doing here? Why evolutionism simply is untenable in an age of scientific enlightenment. And remember, this is not just a apologetic issue, it's the apologetic issue. How one views their origins ultimately will determine how they live their life. Huh. I actually agree with them on those last two points. First, this is an apologetics issue, not a scientific one. The scientific evidence is quite clear that everything this guy is saying is bogus. And number two, our understandings of our origins does impact the way that we live our lives. I know that I am just one human out of billions. I know that I am a part of this earth just as much as this earth is part of me. I know that I'm not that special, and I know that I'm not going to be alive for very much longer. My understanding of my origins makes me more compassionate, more humble, more kind, more hardworking, and it helps me to remember to not sweat the small stuff. I struggle to imagine what it would be like to believe that the whole universe was made especially with me in mind. To arrogate myself as a part of some hideous plan that guides the formation of stars and the devastation of hurricanes alike. To think that I was so important in a world with so much pain and misery and death genuinely horrifies me. And if you're like me and you don't think that you're that special and you don't think that this world is perfect but that it actually needs a lot of work, please consider donating to organizations like Feeding America, the Human Rights Campaign, and the National Federation for the Blind. I'll make sure that they're all linked down in the description below. We're all in this together and we need to take care of each other. As for this, I give this whole series a science teacher challenge level 2 out of 10. In all fairness, he was only pulling snippets from his book, but if you're gonna promote a book, you'd probably include, like, maybe some of the better arguments, right? So, like, I just, I'm not confident that the rest of the book would be any more compelling than what we saw here. More than anything, I'm just super disappointed because, like, I've heard of this guy so much and I really expected this to be, like, a big, crazy thing, but honestly, these arguments were worse than most. Like, John and Jane are worlds more interesting than this guy, and they usually debunk themselves. And last but not least, if you're gonna be in Anaheim, California between June 22nd and June 25th, come see me at VidCon! I'm a featured creator this year! And I'm gonna be doing a panel and a stage show and looking for any other opportunity I can get to meet and hang out with people. So come join the party! And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other stuff that you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. If you like terrible podcasts, I've got one of those linked down below as well. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye!